So thank you everyone for coming um, day before the long weekend. Appreciate you coming out. Um, I'm super excited to introdu introduce Cass. He's a PhD student at MIT. Um, and we, we found his paper on archive in the group and like, oh man, we need to talk to this guy. This is awesome. Um, and I think it's particularly appropriate because normally the, the first paper that I think about when I think of reinforcement learning with human feedback is Sophie's Kitchen also from MIT. So it's great to have another MIT person here talk to, talking to us today about what I think is a really important topic. So with that, I'll hand it over to Cass. Well, thanks so much. That's very kind. Uh, and just thanks to everyone, uh, people who coordinated with me over email. Uh, thanks for the intro. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I'm Steven Casper. Most people call me Cass. And you can usually find me at MIT. My email is should be on Zoom. It's scasper at mit.edu. And I'm excited to talk a bit about um, some of this survey work uh, that's been done involving reinforcement learning from human feedback. And just uh, there are a lot of authors on this paper. It's been a pretty interesting process to like write a paper with so many people. Uh, they're all listed in the bottom right of the screen here. But as an especial um, like thanks and acknowledgement to Xander Davies. Uh, who is the other first author on the paper with me and my advisor Dylan Hadfield Manel. It's been really nice to work with all of these people. Uh, so I'm excited to talk, talk a, a bit about uh, open problems and fundamental limitations of RLHF. Uh, if you go and look at the paper, and maybe some of you have, what you'll probably like the, the, the immediate takeaway you'll see from it is that like it's it does, does a lot of laundry listing and a lot of like semi in depth like um, looks at various aspects of this whole like RLHF question and problem and many things involving it. And the paper in that certain sense is very listy and very low level. And somewhat in contrast to that, I want to give a bit of a presentation today that takes a higher level perspective on um, some of what we think is more striking about RLHF now having written this survey paper on it. Uh, so that'll be some of my focus today. I think there's a fairly big audience, so uh, stop going questions might be a little hard. If they're important ones, you can ask them, but maybe we'll just save questions for the end. Um, and I think I'll get started. And the way to get started with the story about RLHF is actually one that I think is pretty unclear. Uh, having written this paper with so many authors, one thing that I kind of uh, learned, which was kind of funny, is that if you talk about like the story of RLHF beginning at some particular point or other, lots of people have some pretty strong and interesting feelings about like when we should really start talking about the history of RLHF, you know, um, and for example, you know, if, if you ever say that like the Cristiano paper, though the one that, um, you know, really popularized this type of method in 2017 is the beginning of it, you might find a lot of people, you know, very quickly try to correct you in some way or other. And, and I think that's pretty valid. Uh, we have a history that arguably like really kind of like caught some footing in the mid 2000s. Um, for example, the Netflix challenge ended up bringing a lot of attention toward methods in machine learning that aim to infer human preferences from uh, their behavior or from data about them. Uh, I think that was 2007, but don't quote me on that. I might have been a little bit earlier. Uh, another thing that emerged in the mid 2000s was a framework called Tamer, which is actually very, very similar to RLHF and has most of the same parts. There's a human giving some sort of assessment of how a machine learning system performs. Uh, these assessments are used to train some sort of supervised reward model. And this supervised reward model is used to help train the actual AI system of interest. And uh, this, this Tamer framework introduced, I think, in 2007 or 2008 by uh, Bradley Knox at all. You know, it's so old that if you look Do we do we start panicking now or do we wait a little bit more? <laughs> oh, he rage quit. <laughs> Yeah. 
Do you know what you call a fish that's missing an eye? Hey, am I am I back? Hey, you're back. Awesome. Very nice. All right. You were just talking about tamer and we lost, so much. Your, lost the audio. All right. Let's um let me get back. I think I, I noticed the challenge. So I think I fixed it. And um I'm gonna take just a second to reopen my keynote. But uh, yeah, so I was talking about Tamer. And uh, one thing I was remarking about Tamer is that uh, the diagram I showed on the slide uh, called the policy an action selector and not a policy. I don't know if you heard me say that or not, but I, th I thought it was pretty funny because like this idea of like, which RLHF is based on, hey, these feedback type methods really have a pretty long history. Hey, Kat, can you share yeah. screen Yes, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm in, the, in the process of opening it. Oh, okay. I'm ad-libbing. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, and I'm back once I share. All right, thanks for the patience, everyone. Now you're back. That looks great. Great. Uh, now I just need to find it. Okay. And then, um, so Tamer was, I think, circa 2008. Uh, but and then I'll fast forward a bit to 2017 uh, to point out a third thing, which is a notable survey paper by Christian Wirth et al., which I think did a pretty good job of like, wrapping up the state of the field as of about 2017. Uh, so this is all kind of what I'll call the like the pre-2017 history of RLHF, though, because there was a pretty big, um, you know, change in, in what happened in 2017 uh, with the Cristiano paper. And maybe a lot of a lot of you are familiar with what I'm talking about. But this paper was titled Deep uh, Reinforcement Learning from Human Preferences. And what they did in this paper was just an application of these relatively old ideas, but they got it to work quite well. And this brought a lot of attention to these types of feedback based methods. So uh, this was an open AI paper. And what they did was they worked with uh, simulated physics agents uh, who had these like bodies inside of uh, these Majoko physics engines. And um, in this case, it was a, a hopper agent. And with about a hundred, sorry, with about a thousand queries to a human, they were able to teach this uh, policy controlling this simulated physics body in the, in, the, in the Majoko environment in order to do a backflip. And that's pretty impressive because even though these ideas had been around for a while, right, for more than 10 years at this point, many of them, no one had really up until 2017 gotten some sort of agent to do something like this and it was pretty cool like especially for the time that OpenAI got the agent to do a freaking backflip and um this seemed to like serve a pretty uh, as a pretty distinct like at least landmark in the development of rlhf and associated ideas just because of how much popularity it brought to uh this type of method and um this is kind of where even if it's not like the most technically correct to say that like a certain type of story with RLHF begins or a certain sub story. It's certainly maybe morally correct in a sense, because this is really where things started to pick up steam. And the, the technique, and I'll, this next slide will be somewhat of a review that was really used here. Uh, we like to describe as just kind of having this, like these three components that all interact. And this is how we explain it. This is a figure from the paper. Um, so I'll actually start on the right side. There's this policy that you're going to initialize or pre-train or whatever you may do. And this is the uh, system of interest. This is the thing that you actually want to be performing some particular task, right? In this, this case, it is the neural network controlling the hopper agent's actions. And uh, once this is initialized, it's not going to be doing anything in particular, but uh, it'll be doing something. And if you uh, gather examples or trajectories from it, you can then present these to a human. And the human can assess these in some form or other. In this particular case, a human looked at different trajectory, two different trajectory pairs from the hopper agent and was able to rate one as better than the other, like B was better than A or A was better than B. Uh, so we have this a process in green here where human feedback is provided. Uh, and that feedback, even though it's just simple like binary preferences, if enough of it is gathered, it can be sufficiently rich to train uh, this third part of the process, which is a reward model shown in blue. 
Uh, and this reward model is just a supervised learning system trained on a logistic loss in this case, um, but it's used to uh, reflect the human's feedback as best as possible, or it's trained to do so. And then that can be used to provide rewards for updating the policy using reinforcement learning. And this process can happen cyclically or uh, synchronously, um, but there are these three different uh, parts of it that are, that are uh, going on. These three different components to what, uh, like, key algorithmic components to what RLHF has been uh, has become and been used as. And this was, um, you know, kind of the state of the art around about 2017 when the Christiana paper came out. And then not too much longer after this, uh, people started using language models as uh, policy policies, and then uh, doing a version of RLHF that's uh, versions of RLHF that started to do some pretty impressive stuff in uh, natural language processing. So. Um, Another notable paper among a few others around the same time that came around was Ziegler et al. in 2019, uh, also from OpenAI, who started doing some pretty impressive like language-based tasks with this approach. Uh, and I'll just, uh, you know, all the same algorithmic components are here, but I just have a few more details on the process to just give an example of how this, is, this really plays out. So the policy in this case is a uh, language model, like uh, a GPT or something. Uh, human feedback in this case is going to come in the forms of like conversation pairs or explanation or summarization pairs or some form of a you know text for some form of task and a human is just going to select through some interface if it thinks a is better or b is better uh, the reward model like i explained before is going to be fit with a logistic based loss or, or cross entropy based loss on the binary pair which is the same um, on these examples and it's going to learn to reflect the type of feedback that the human is giving and then this is going to be used for reinforcement learning and um this thing this our version of rlhf that is applied to language models as we all know has become like a pretty influential and popular thing especially in the past like uh, year or year and a half and fast forward to today, uh, as we also all know, RLHF-based uh, models have become the state of the art for very, very advanced AI systems, specifically in the domain of natural language processing. You know, we're probably all pretty familiar with ChatGPT from OpenAI and Google's BARD, uh, Anthropics Claude and Claude 2, and now from Meta we have Llama 2, which are all, uh, you know, able, obviously very, very impressive. And um, I don't want to make any, like, uh, I don't, I don't want to express any opinions here, partially because I don't have them, and if I did, I wouldn't want to express them. But something that we can, you know, definitely infer here by like the fact that these companies are rolling out models here, and the fact that they have now hundreds of uh, user bases in the size of hundreds of millions, you know, is is a sort of tacit statement that these companies are making about the confidence that they have in their techniques based on RLHF in order to make these highly influential, highly advanced and potentially very powerful AI systems, you know, aligned with humans in a way that's sufficient for this type of application, right? By putting out these systems, uh, these different companies are, are, are saying, at least tacitly, that they're confident enough in their methods in RLHF. Uh, that they're confident enough that that's okay, that the, the things are going to be uh, safe and safe and fine. And I'm not saying that they're wrong about this. They might be very, very right about this. Um, but this is definitely like a sort of endorsement about the methodology here. And um, these types of models, though, trained with RLHF have obviously not been without problems and challenges. Uh, here, I'm just actually going to show a paragraph ripped from straight from the survey paper um, where we talk about some of these challenges that have rolled out in the past uh, year or so that we've been able to observe. For example, RLHF trained foundation models like these have revealed sensitive private information about people. They have hallucinated untrue content. They've spread biases that favor specific political ideologies. They've exhibited sycophantic responses. They've expressed undesirable preferences like not wanting to be shut down. Um, they've been vulnerable to jailbreaking and prompt injection or extraction attacks. So there's kind of just been a series of problems that uh, we've discovered like as a society with these pro uh, models as they've been like deployed and rolled out. And um, this is not just things that happened like nine months ago with uh, the old version of Chad GPT that like uh, back-ended chat gpt 3.5 from a few updates ago uh this is ongoing uh lots of people have given a lot of attention in the past month to a new paper that came out at the same time as um icml was going on from some people at carnegie mellon and the center for ai safety um where they introduced a new some new types of uh, jailbreaking attacks on uh, systems that transferred between 
you know, uh, Claude and ChatGPT and Bard and Llama. Uh, so this arms race is still like going on. There are new problems discovered, and like these companies like OpenAI are going to patch them. And uh, we can expect, you know, if this uh, plays out like other adversarial arms races have played out in other parts of the machine learning literature, we can expect this to keep going on. Right. So what's clear is that we've observed a lot of problems with these systems. And I'm not going to say that this is a good or a bad thing because I don't know. And because I don't think I would want to say, even if I did have a formed opinion here, I think it's, but it's probably too soon to say. But there is a certain sense um, in which this is a good thing and which this is a bad sign. And I want to, I think um, both of these perspectives are worth some airtime. So there's a really good argument to be made that all of these problems have been very good to encounter so because we can learn a lot of useful lessons from them and i think this is a strategy that open ai at least is very actively taking if you go to like chat gpt it's now pretty known um, a lot of details and a lot of uh, vulnerabilities here where at least in the past a lot of jailbreaking attacks can be used to make chat gpt say something that's kind of crude or like offensive or objectionable in some sort of way uh, so it's possible to get Chad GPT to say sentences like this. And if OpenAI really, really wanted this to never happen, they could have prevented it. It's not hard to just go and pull some relatively small language model down from like the Hugging Face Transformers library and just use it off the shelf to recognize most types of sentences that are like obviously toxic or offensive in some way. And if OpenAI really wanted like ChatGPT to never say something bad, OpenAI could just use some sort of toxicity classifier or other objectionable content classifier off the shelf and they could either like block or redact or regenerate responses uh, that uh, showed something objectionable. But very clearly, OpenAI has made the choice to not incorporate this into the chat GPT uh, interfaces or API. And this is probably a good sign, a good thing for them, because as more and more of these vulnerabilities become more and more public over time, you know, these are uh, Lesson, there are lessons that can be learned from each of these problems, and there are patches that can be made for each of these problems, right? So that's the perspective from which this is a very good thing, and probably companies like OpenAI are very intentional about trying to, you know, learn lessons where it's possible to learn lessons here. And, you know, chatbots are chatbots. They can do important things, but, uh, you know, no one is afraid of chatbots, right? Um, at least instances in which a person should be afraid of a chatbot are, are very, very rare. Um, when people are scared of, uh, you know, a scary AI futures, it's not chatbots online that they're scared of. So that's the that's the case for this being a good thing. But I think there's this uh, other point about this being a very bad sign, right? Because OpenAI, other companies, before deploying these systems, have put lots and lots of time and resources and money into doing internal red teaming and evaluations to understand and patch all the problems that they could. You know, I think OpenAI was very proud of like publicly announcing that they spent six whole months doing red teaming evals and patches on chat GPT um, or, or GPT-4 it was before they actually like, uh, you know, made any of the details about it at all uh, public in their report in the GPT-4 model card. And um, despite all of this effort that a company like OpenAI has put into this, there have been all these problems still. Uh, that have you know rolled out continuously uh, since the uh, introduction of this type of system and it's from this perspective that i think we might have some other lessons to learn about like maybe things so that we should be very worried about or at least cautious of the fact that even despite all this red teaming and despite OpenAI's best efforts along with other companies to like make these models as airtight as possible they have very clearly not been airtight and i think it's observing some of these failures recently that has contributed to a lot of sympathy for the perspective that you know AI systems as they become more and more advanced and applied in more and more consequential applications where the stakes are potentially higher and higher really could pose very large risks to society in various ways. And um, a lot of waves were made in recent months about the extinction letter where a lot of um, scientists and other notable figures in the research and AI communities have uh, declared that mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. And I think that a very, like, at least one argument for this perspective can be made by just thinking that, you know, if we do have AI systems that are, you know, an, another few steps more advanced from the state of the art, that do have the potential to be 
do a lot of good or a lot of harm if they're deployed in consequential applications. If we have this, and if it goes the same way that RLHF trained LLMs have gone with problem after problem surfacing, that seems like a recipe for lots of risks. And there's a sense in which this, the, the way that the whole story with RLHF has gone up to this point, and uh, you know, there's a sense in which this was never really a certain type of intention behind for, from a certain type of person um, that's very safety conscious. For example, uh, Paul Cristiano, the first author of the Cristiano et al. paper from 2017, the one that I talked about earlier as being a milestone. Uh, Paul Cristiano wrote a blog post earlier, early this year in January, uh, titled Thoughts on the Impact of RLHF Research. And overall, he is more positive than negative about the impacts because he is pretty sympathetic to this perspective that we've learned a lot of useful lessons from it. But one thing that he remarks in this blog post is that I think it's hard to productively work on more challenging alignment problems without first implementing basic solutions. So he's referring to RLHF as a basic solution to study up challenges in alignment in order to work toward better solutions to our, our, our problems later on. And if you're Paul Cristiano in, and others uh, working on this type of problem in 2017, I think from any perspective, uh, a very bearish AI one or a very bullish AI one, it doesn't matter. From any perspective, this was the right thing to work on at the time, whether your concerns are about uh, you know, risks or rewards. Um, because RLHF really, really was a new and interesting framework to study this whole alignment process through. But as time has gone on, there's in more and more of an argument to be made that RLHF has started to pose potentially like concerning risks that might outweigh some of the benefits, um, simply because its impacts on capabilities research and you know how it's changing the rapid development of, of AI systems have been much, much more prominent than its direct impacts on like what lessons we can learn from safety. Like both are very clearly there. But one of my co-authors at one point described what has happened with RLHF as potentially being a capabilities capture in which something that made sense at the time a while ago to work on for safety motivated reasons, you know, uh, may not actually have been very useful for safety compared to how useful it is for uh, advancing capabilities. And I'm not saying that advancing capabilities is bad. I'm not making any claims here, but there is a, per a very cautious perspective that um, might be sympathetic towards slowing down AI progress from uh, so that society can adapt to it more or so that we can uh, govern it better because governance bodies you know, move slower than technical progress. Um, which, and that perspective is not 100% on how our, our LHF is probably gone, right? And to be fair, um, I think this idea that RLHF uh, being a basic solution to alignment is really not just like one that Paul has. It's not just one that bearish AI safety people have. Uh, it's one that OpenAI like also openly admits. They had a an agenda that they called their super alignment agenda that they released earlier this summer, um, where they kind of outlined some of their plans for the next few years. And, and they wrote word for word, our current techniques for aligning AI, such as RLHF, rely on humans' ability to supervise AI, but humans won't be able to reliably supervise AI systems much smarter than us, which is as clear of an admission is anything that you know RLHF in the highest stakes applications are is not going to be you know something that we should ever rely on keeping us safe if if we ever come to situations like this. And again, I want to emphasize I'm not really making any claims about like whether RLHF is positive or negative or whether OpenAI or Paul Cristiano or anyone else has made any particular decision the right way or the wrong way. But there's certainly a lot we should be like mindful and potentially concerned about here and a lot of like risks that we should be wary of and maybe some lessons that can be learned. And this is the perspective that I and I think all of my other co-authors had when we worked on this paper, Open Problems and Fundamental Limitations with RLHF. Uh, we think that uh, you know, even though things are still rapidly progressing, there's been a lot, go there's been enough going on with RLHF to justify a good attempt to systematize lots of the knowledge and challenges and possible solutions that we have for it. And this was our, our main motivation headed in, heading into writing this paper. And um, I think this, the paper itself and this talk, if you get anything from the talk, you know, might provide like some different perspectives and potentially different uh, 
sources of value. You know, for example, uh, the most important part of the paper is section three, uh, which is actually just admittedly kind of a laundry list where we go through a lot of challenges with RLHF and do our best to explain them in the literature on each of them. And this is probably going to be the most useful part of the paper for people in the future who want to like treat it as a point of reference. Um, but I only have one slide on this entire this entire section, uh, and it's right here. Uh, this is a figure we use in the paper. Uh, just like we try to uh, explain RLHF as having these three distinct algorithmic components, human feedback, the reward model, and the policy. Uh, we identify challenges with human feedback, the reward model, and the policy, and uh, divide and taxonomize them as such. And uh, each of the little sub bubbles in this figure are going to correspond to a subsection of chapter three or uh, section three. And uh, each of those subsections has one or more challenges listed under it. And I'd love to talk about any of these with anyone if you want to like ask questions about it later or if you want to send me an email, you know, my inbox is open. Um, but if I got if I went too much more in detail right now, I'd very quickly be getting in the weeds of some specific problem or other. So I'm going to leave that at just this slide. There are a lot of challenges and we do our best to like systematically understand them. And this first like level of taxonomy we have is the one that divides them as uh, being associated with human feedback, the reward model, or the policy. Another observation, though, that we make that I think is pretty noteworthy and that I want to talk about is that there's a there's another way of kind of like carving up challenges with RLHF. And uh, we do this in the paper as well as kind of like an inner or second level taxonomy, where we make a distinction between tractable versus fundamental challenges. So the tractable challenges are ones that are very clearly addressable or straightforward to like work on with technical solutions. For example, one challenge associated with RLHF is it just involves selecting and training human evaluators to provide good feedback that represents what uh, the right, you know, what, what, what humans think. And I don't want to trivialize this at all because this is a really, really hard logistical, technical, socio-technical problem. But it's one that there's no like, you know, there's no theorem out there. There's no contradiction out there. There's no um, fundamental issue or reason why we wouldn't be able to um, get this right if we got all the methods right. Another one of these challenges is that, you know, uh, training reward models and policies in alternation can introduce uh, issues because if you're training one thing and then training the other again and again and again, there's there are moving target problems that are kind of reasonably well known about now in the literature. And um, this is another thing that they're just protected, potential, uh, simple, though not trivial, uh, technical solutions for. But we contrast problems like this with ones that are more fundamental. Uh, for example, a fundamental challenge with RLHF is that humans can't supervise superhuman models, like OpenAI said, or that reward models and policies can misgeneralize even when they're trained with the correct learning signal. And calling these challenges fundamental is not saying that we can't make progress on these or significantly alleviate concerns associated with these by having a better technical approach, because we definitely can. But there is a sense in which these problems are never just going to be able to go away, uh, no matter how good we get at doing RLHF. Because as long as, you know, for example, there's a human in the loop, or as long as there's a reward model training a policy, these are always going to be challenges that uh, we're never going to be able to completely avoid. So in that sense, these are fundamental limitations. And solving them would require some sort of approach that would no longer be RLHF. And um, in addition to, you know, most of the fundamental challenges that we identify. There are also a few fundamental challenges that are fundamental, not because they're fundamental to RLHF, but because they're fundamental to the whole process of like trying to make safe, advanced, aligned AI systems. For example, there's this whole question about alignment to whom. Uh, and there's quite a lot of emphasis in lots of circles of people working on AI about like aligning AI systems. But Aligning an AI system to a single person, while it's a convenient technical problem, is not the real socio-technical one that we face. And there's no way of really getting around aligning uh, this problem of alignment to whom, because humans don't always agree with things, right? There's no technical challenge to be solved when we're, uh, from an alignment perspective. If we want like AI systems to represent humanity, there are only choices to be made and consequences to be dealt with. And sometimes those consequences are going to be dealt with by the people who aren't even making the choices. 
So this other obs another observation that I wanted to like highlight on this slide is just that like some of these challenges are really ones that we uh, should have optimism for solving, and, and other ones are going to be ones that we're never really going to fully uh, you know be able to get rid of, uh, no matter how good we get at the technical aspects of RLHF. Another uh, sort of high level observation that kind of struck us when we were uh, more and more over time as we went through the process of writing this paper is that RLHF is very, very new and very, very old at the same time. And there's this, there's, there's a certain thesis, and I won't say this is like, you know, the story of RLHF, because I don't think there is a story of RLHF, but there is an argument to be made that RLHF has been doing a lot of rehashing lessons from historical failures. Um, and I hope you like what we did there with the acronym. But um, in, take the individual components of RLHF, you know, so eliciting human feedback or using human uh, labels or metadata to train a reward model with supervised learning, policy optimization. All of these things have been around forever, right? Um, or they've at least been very actively researched among machine learning interested folks since, you know, well before the year 2000, this whole like human feedback process or the supervised learning process or this reinforcement learning process. And from this perspective, you know, RLHF as a set of ideas or as a set of algorithmic components is very, very old. What's new is uh, using RLHF with like modern systems and modern approaches to machine learning that allow it to be like very, very scalable and able to do uh, amazing things with today's state of the art language models. And one thing that um, we, and as we're writing this paper, we notice over and over again that we're just talking about challenges that are very, very old, but that persist with RLHF systems nonetheless today. And we think there's some sort of thesis to be like concluded from this or to be drawn from this observation about how it's probably important not to let the uh, new and impressive and striking and exciting things about RLHF at least completely eclipse. Um, lots of things that we've known for a long time about uh, problems with it. This next slide is a little bit of a footnote, actually. Uh, I've been talking about uh, in a few different uh, points in time, like, you know, RLHF isn't the solution. So if RLHF isn't the solution to, you know, the alignment problem in theory, like what could be the solution? And I'll just want to back this up by like pointing toward the best resource I know about it. This is a paper from 2020 uh, in which uh, which is titled an overview of 11 proposals for building safe advanced AI. If any of you want to like reference this, you should do it. Um, it's a little bit old, but I don't think it's aged poorly. And it talks about like 11 different types of ways that we could um, structure processes for training AI systems in ways that have like better guarantee, uh, theoretical guarantees related to alignment than RLHF does. And notably, none of these 11 include RLHF. So if you're interested in like referring to like what I mean by you know, things that could be better than it, this this paper points to some good examples. Notably, uh, some of these approaches are uh, based on different ways of doing uh, recursive reward modeling and debate, but I'll just leave it at that. Uh, another striking observation that we made about RLHF is that despite its popularity and ubiquity in the state of the art, um, in these systems that are being used by now hundreds of millions of people, uh, there are a lot of senses in which we still truly, genuinely do not really understand what is going on when we perform RLHF. And I mean that very literally and very directly. So, for example, uh, at the, there's this interface between, you know, humans and um, in order to, between humans and the AI systems uh, demonstrations in order to collect feedback. And there is strikingly little public research about what is really going on when you put humans in front of computers and uh, have them provide feedback on different trajectories in a setup like RLHFs, and what really influences the, the way they give feedback and the type of feedback that they give. Uh, for example, it's really not known how, what you train, how you train people and what you tell them, how that really affects what they do. Another perspective in which we don't really know that much about RLHF is from like sociology and social choice the theory. So obviously there's a sociological angle to take at the whole study of RLHF, because if you're trying to align an AI system as best you can to multiple humans at once with diverse and potentially conflicting interests, you know, we can, we can study this from uh, the lens of social sciences. But more specifically, we think it's very striking that 
the field of social choice theory um, does not know what RLHF is actually doing. As in, when we use RLHF with different types of feedback, like scalar feedback or um, comparison-based feedback or um, you know, correction-based feedback, et cetera, it's not currently known. There's no public work on what social choice function RLHF is actually implementing, or at least will do so asymptotically. And I say this is not known yet in a little bit of a foreshadowy way, because uh, one of the co-authors is working on this problem right now, and we'll have a paper out a bit uh, in, in a little bit. Um, but as of now, this is currently like not known, at least not publicly, from the lens of uh, social choice theory, what RLHF does. Uh, we think another interesting like way of thinking about RLHF is from the lens of Bayesian inference, especially with language models. Uh, because the way to perform things with a language model is to start with a pre-trained base model and then to train it using the signal from some sort of reward model that you train, but also to incorporate into this process a reward based on um, a lack of divergence from the base model. Uh, or another way to describe this is to KL regularize the distribution of outputs from the model during training compared to its 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 outputs at the beginning of training. And this has the effect of like making it so that you don't get like weird optimization failures where the policy overfits to the reward model and then starts outputting gibberish. This makes it produce more like, you know, good English text. And um, you can use this, you can view this as a process of Bayesian inference. And there's a paper on this about how um, reinforcement learning with KL penalties is a form of Bayesian inference. And it's really not known very well how different ways of incorporating this penalty into the process actually affects the inference procedure in a Bayesian, from, from a Bayesian lens. Um, or in other words, we don't really have a good grasp on what priors we're introducing into the optimization process. Um, and what data those priors are derived from, you know, since there's so much text that's on the internet that things are pre-trained on, we, we don't have a good grasp of this either. Um, there is a lot of interest, but we think there's a lot more work to be done on studying RLHF trained systems in their worst case behavior. And we think that more work like this is going to continue to be very, very valuable in the future. And um, another thing that we find is pretty striking is that RLHF is almost always conducted in a way that is quite dramatically misspecified. For example, the wrong thing to do would be to model examples such as these uh, X sub i's as being drawn from a distribution specified from your policy or your, your, your network or pi sub theta. And then to model the feedback from the human as Y sub i as being a function of the human, the examples, and noise. This is how things are typically done with our LHF where it's just kind of assumed that the model produces these examples and then humans uh, give noisy feedback on these examples. And this is a very, very convenient modeling assumption to make. Um, but obviously this is, this is not very correct because with language models, examples are often generated with interesting procedures interactively or drawn from different types of adversarial or non-adversarial distributions. Uh, humans, there are different humans in the process. So you can't model things as one human and you can't model disagreements between humans as just random noise. Uh, humans can have access to more information than just an example. They could also be looking using interpretability tools to understand what the model is doing. And um, the feedback process isn't just can't just be a function of like an example because a rendering of an example can also be lossy and it's these considerations and other considerations that like cause us in the appendix to try to propose an improved model of the feedback process and it gets very very complex very very quickly and uh, no need to explain what's at the bottom of the screen it would be very boring anyway um, but if you're very very interested you could go to the appendix but the point is um, you know we don't really usually study RLHF under the correct like technical specification in the first place. So after uh, this, be talking about a few, um, you know, notable observations and uh, some other contributions that we make in the paper are related to like how we might go about addressing some of the addressable problems with RLHF. These are the ones that are particularly like technical or tractable. In section four point two, you know, we uh, divide in the same way as we divide challenges, uh, some of the potential solutions and frameworks that we can use to make progress. And we actually feel really, really excited about this. You know, most of the co-authors on this paper have worked on like some of the solutions that we have identified in this subsection of chapter of, of section four uh, at some point or other. 
And uh, we think this is really important. Uh, but again, if I go too much into weeds here, I'll just be talking about very specific things really quickly. So I'll, let's save that for email or something. Um, but then in the last section of the paper, or the last content section, uh, we talk about AI governance and what um, paradigms or what needs are going to kind of crop up in the governance world as a result of what we've observed from RLHF and, and how quickly it has led to the advancement of like uh, AI systems that we're seeing today. And some of what we say on about governance, I think is like good and necessary, but admittedly boring. We talk about how auditing seems really useful, for example. And we talk about how, you know, governance structures can do a lot of good if they put good incentives for, um, you know, safety and social welfare. Uh, if, if they hang that over companies. And this is good, but I don't have that much to say about it because it's boring. Something that I have a little bit more to say about is some of the specific thoughts we have about how transparency might be able to meaningfully improve the uh, research and development ecosystem around RLHF in a way that seems pretty broadly beneficial, we think, from almost every shareholder's perspective. And there's a high level perspective here and there's a low level perspective here. We think that more transparency to the public or auditors uh, can be useful for one, catching problems as they arise, because uh, the more access, the more people have to a system, the better uh, the job they're going to be able to do it, like identifying possible problems. Uh, we also think that it's going to lead to better incentives, because if companies are held to any formal or informal standard it's in which they're required or compelled to disclose details about their approach, uh, then they're going to have more and better incentives to like make sure that their approach is very good. And we also think that it's just going to be very useful to like help us and us being society and academia track RLHF's progress and challenges so that we can have a better idea going further and further into the future, like how viable of a solution it might be to various types of problems um, with various levels of risk involved. At a low level, we talk about a bunch of specific things that we think that uh, developers of systems, like very advanced systems using RLHF should disclose about the process. So for example, you know, over on the left here, we talk about how disclosing pre-training details, like what data you're using and where that's coming from, uh, could be indicative of risks. And we talk about how you know, quite a number of other things could be indicative of risks if um, it's, it's disclosed as part of an auditing procedure or as part of a standard like publicization procedure. Uh, so, uh, and we think that like, a better incentives from governance actors can be pretty useful for encouraging beneficial types of transparency in this particular case. Finally, um, there are other problems with governance to look into as well. You know, uh, one perspective here comes from thinking about just how RLHF is a big algorithmic advancement that when paired with, you know, technical and engineering advancements, is able to you know, produce these very, very powerful, advanced, monetizable systems. And with a system as useful and interesting as something like ChatGPT, that comes with opportunities for a lot of like, money and power to be concentrated in the hands of potentially very few people who uh, are in control of like companies and influential here. Uh, who are the people who are inside the like, you know, cutting edge regime of, of AI development. And, you know, governance should think about this and how we as a society should like potentially respond to the consolidation of lots of money and power in tech companies. Another angle that governance actors should think about involves uh, social justice. For example, uh, I think a lot of people at this point have seen an article that came out, I believe, in the spring from Times about how uh, OpenAI contracted some workers in a way that was not like the most ethical and the best from a labor uh, perspective, right? They used a Kenyan cohort of knowledge workers and ended up paying them a very low wage of less than $2 per hour USD in order to make chat GPT less toxic. And uh, the story doesn't end with this article from in the spring. There's a more recent piece that came out in July from Karen Howe of the Wall Street Journal that really talked more in depth about kind of what happened in this specific uh, cohort in the specific case in which OpenAI outsourced a lot of this uh, this work. So uh, you can ask this question, like, why was a particular cohort of people in Kenya used to provide a lot of like useful human feedback data in this case? Um, Karen Howe describes 
first of all, Kenya is a low income country and it has a very high unemployment rate. Wages are really low, which is very attractive to tech companies that are trying to increase their profit margins. And it's also a highly educated workforce that speaks English because of colonization and there's good Wi-Fi infrastructure. Now, this um, article, it's really a podcast transcript. It goes on to talk more about what individual knowledge workers here experienced as a result of their contract work with OpenAI. And I previously had a different slide that I was going to show next with a lot more text and some redactions and a content warning, um, but it got pretty messy pretty quickly. So I'll just kind of explain. And if anyone wants details, you should go look at this podcast transcript. But this article goes on to talk about the, and, and quote from the uh, individual experiences of these knowledge workers in this Kenyan cohort about what they worked with, right? And as you might imagine, when you're doing uh, moderation style work, for a natural language processing AI systems. There's a lot of bad stuff that you end up looking at. And these, this cohort of knowledge workers often ended up looking at very, very bad things or, or reading very, very graphic and disturbing um, descriptions of things that like no one would ever really care to imagine or talk about um, in any sort of proper setting, right? Just like, there, there, there are things described in this in this podcast transcript that like are just they're not described gra graphically, but if they were described graphically, like it would feel very, very uncomfortable to read them to anyone. And this podcast also goes on to quote some of these knowledge workers' experiences about like how this affected them in their day to day life after they were exposed to this type of content very, very consistently over an extended period of time. And these knowledge workers, uh, there are their quotes from this podcast about how it affected their sleep and their feelings of security and happiness on a day-to-day -day basis and their interactions with their family, et cetera. And I think this kind of closes the case about how we have an instance in which OpenAI had contracted people because they were easily available in a way that was very demographically targeted arguably underpaid them by quite a large amount for work that caused pretty notable harms to their psychological well-being. And obviously there's something about this that isn't very great, but if it like helps drive thing homes, things home a little bit, I know you're all in Edmonton, but uh, the Belmont report from the US federal government uh, says that this exact type of thing is not very, this is not good in, um, research settings. Uh, the Belmont Report writes that the selection of research subjects needs to be scrutinized in order to determine whether some classes are being systematically selected simply because of their easy availability. And there's a technical debate to be had here about whether this Kenyan cohort of knowledge workers are like research subjects because oh, versus some other category like contract workers. But um, this technical debate, I don't think really has any bearing on the ethical debate here. Uh, and I think from the eth ethical perspective, there was a mistake here uh, made. And I think OpenAI has realized that this was a, a mistake, uh, the way they went about uh, this particular uh, way of getting lots of feedback from, from a cohort of knowledge workers. And I think they've changed. There's no evidence that this kind of thing is, is going on, in all fairness to OpenAI. But there was very clearly a problem here. And if we go back to this question of, you know, at the bottom of the slide of alignment to whom, right? If uh, OpenAI and other companies like Anthropic, right, you know, continue to very, um, you know, zealously talk about their hopes for a positive future with AI and how they're working very, very hard to align it with humanity. You know, I, I hope they succeed in very beneficial ways, but we need to be very cognizant and very like vigilant of when their hands do different things than their mouths, right? And I know that OpenAI is like not a monolith, but this is a very clear instance in which you know, a country, a, a company, if they claim to be doing something for the benefit of humanity, you know, they really have something to answer for if um, their, their employment and labor practices really don't line up with that. And I think this is a pretty clear case of that, that, you know, uh, society at large and governance actors in particular need to uh, be very, very wary of. So where does that leave us? I would love to conclude, uh, but I don't really have a conclusion. I, I've tried at various points in time to really like synthesize cleanly, like everything I think or everything this paper really says about reinforcement learning from human feedback and what it is, what it has been, how we got here, where it's going. And 
I don't really think I know. And I think it's much too soon to say. So the best thing I can give as a conclusion here, I think is just a scrambled set of like impressions and general takeaways. And uh, it's honestly all I've got. So somewhat shamelessly, here's just a big dump of like, I think general uh, ideas that play into a very like complex, difficult to grasp story that's continually evolving about like what RLH, uh, what RLHF is and might become. One thing that I think is very clear is that reinforcement learning from human feedback is a game changer, or at least it's a game changer when uh, compared with uh, all of these, um, you know, highly technical advancements that we're seeing with like uh, compute and, and scaling of AI systems and how they're trained. Another thing that, that's very clear is that there have been many, many challenges with RLHF uh, trained systems and they're ongoing. There's that arms race I talked about uh, earlier in the presentation. There's a lot of good stuff from this arms race. We're learning more and more about how to make these systems more reliable and safe. And this is intentional and this is a good thing to happen. But at the same time, it's really somewhat concerning that we're that we're seeing so many of these challenges because they weren't anticipated, and they were able to slip through the cracks uh, that uh, were left open by even like very very concerted efforts of uh, companies to do their own internal red teaming of their own systems. So if we do have some sort of like super intelligent system or like very very advanced AI systems at any point in the future, hopefully they will not happen. The, the rollout of these systems will not happen like today's RLHF LLMs have rolled out. Another part of the story is that it seems like we have quite a lot more to learn from studying RLHF and its shortcomings, and we should continue to do so, and we should continue to try so to solve problems and find more problems uh, because there's going to be, there's a lot of rich research to be done here, we think. We also think that lots of progress can be made on basic understanding and tractable problems, but there are going to be fundamental challenges that are never going to fully 100% be solved. And as long as we're using RLHF, we're going to um, be facing these to some extent. And instead of solving these challenges within RLHF, we're going to have to turn to other methods to avoid them or to compensate for them. Companies to be, need to be audited and need to be accountable. And finally, um, most maybe most importantly, you know, RLHF is not all you need. Uh, we actually had a, a working draft of the paper that went on for a few months, and that uh, that draft of the paper was tentatively titled for a while. Reinforcement human learning from human feedback is not all you need, and we ended up changing it. And I like the change that we made, but I, I do like how the old title kind of like emphasized how, you know, even though RLHF is doing able to do very very cool things, that doesn't. Uh, that doesn't obviate the need for redundant layers of protection involving incentives and governance and um, the construction of, of AI systems and how they're deployed and how they're audited and how they're evaluated. Um, there's there's going to be an important need to like have multiple layers of protection so that we can avoid uh, fallout from possible AI failures as they happen in the future. So uh, excuse the fact that the conclusion here isn't much of a conclusion at all and is really just a, a set of ideas. Um, but in my defense, I, I will say that one of the only things I'm very confident about with RLHF is that I think it's much too soon to say uh, what the overall impacts are and like where we're going with it. So with that, I just want to say like thanks to everyone. I really appreciate the chance to uh, present and uh, there might be maybe three minutes for questions, but I want you to all know that you should have my email and you can uh, send me an email whenever you'd like. My inbox is open. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, there is already one question in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, let me open that. Sorry. Or I can read it. Um, almost okay. all deployed RLHF solutions have involved large amounts of human training data. What do you think is a good way for people in academia to make progress on these fundamental challenges if our studies are all of much smaller scale? Yeah. And I think this is a pretty a pretty good like question because uh this is something that like academia has been more on the wagon for than the car for or the truck for. So um I think what we're seeing so so 
we've seen some advancements in uh, like maybe what you'd call mid-scale AI uh, systems. And I know like what a mid-scale AI system is like constantly changes, but I'm thinking like sub 50 B. Um, there have been some, uh, there's been some cool models that are, I think some of them are even open source that have been, you know, trained to be like useful assistants that are meant to do the same types of things as something like chat GPT or it's any of its peer models, um, but aren't actually trained with any sort of human feedback at all. Right. And the feedback uh, sometimes is AI generated. Um, sometimes supervised learning is used instead of reinforcement learning. And you you know how like have I think probably pretty often and pretty regularly there's this cadence of like when some new data set or some resource like crops up um, about like you know helpful chat conversations or something uh, they can kind of be uh, used more and more by the, the the academic community and others to uh, do you know get get, get, get like the eighty twenty you know get eighty percent of like what an advanced system like Chat GPT can do with like twenty percent of the scale or twenty percent of the effort, and one of the things that we talk a lot about in the paper is like uh, when we talk about ways to improve RLHF systems, is um, you know using multiple strategies that are not just based on reinforcement learning and not just based on human feedback, because AI feedback seems to have the potential to really, really augment and automate lots of what humans can do uh, more efficiently than they can, uh, you know, manually. And, um, you know, supervised pre-training is really kind of underrated, I think. Um, and there's been some good work recently on like how supervised pre-training of models using a uh, some sort of uh, reward model to like filter or weight data uh, can be really, really useful as well. So um, something that would be a little bit of a mistake might be to think about like RLHF uh, as what it is and what it can be to just be this kind of like rigid process where the only thing that's going into optimizing the network you care about is reinforcement learning. Because uh, in reality, I think there's going to be an interplay of like uh, different pre-training strategies and different fine-tuning strategies that are both supervised and reinforcement learning based that kind of like go into making systems as, you know, redundantly reliable as we can possibly make them. That's a question from here. Hmm? Am I loud enough to be heard? I think yeah. so, yes. So that was a wonderful talk. Lots of interesting ideas that resonate with the thinking about these days. Um, I've been working in medical applications where I work with doctors to try to find the appropriate intervention. And their goals are, of course, trying to save lives, but also trying to reduce pain and suffering and also reduce costs. And you can't have multiple objectives. You have to take an action. You have to find an action which optimizes some reward function. Uh, well, HL, well, uh, for this talk of HLRF, uh, RLHF, uh, solve this problem. Should we be looking at what humans have done as the model what we should be doing? Are there other ways of doing it in this context? Yeah, this, um, and I, I, I'm sure this is, I don't want to st state the obvious too much, but I'll, I'll still state it that like, this is this is one of the types of problems that like RLHF seems like maybe reasonably well equipped for. You know, some of its motivations, we, we've, we've maybe forgot about like some of the, us, but like someone like me, at least, I often like think about RLHF in terms of just what's happening today, because that's what fills my mind. But like the way RLHF was kind of introduced largely like back in 2017 is there's this solution to this reward design problem where handwriting a reward function is really, really hard. Um, it's really hard to make a reward function that's not like gameable or that's not going to get good hearted or result in some sort of like weird edge case where there's a lot of reward, but not a desired behavior. And one of the good things about RLHF is that it makes, um, you know, it, it, it removes the burden on the human to like make a write a good reward function and instead only gives the human the burden of recognizing when they see it. And in that sense, if we're if we're using RLHF, it can possibly be a very, very powerful tool uh, in a very, very important domain like medicine to try to encode what humans think or what human experts think. Um, into some sort of system without actually like having to write that encoding from scratch, right? And so to me, this sounds like one of the, the, the reason, one of the domains to be maybe optimistic about RLHF, although also the same type of domain where we need to be really, really, really careful because it's safety critical. Um, so yeah, I think I think the applicability and the analogy between like most of what I think about, even though I don't work in like most applications most of the time is, is uh, really good and really rich. Does that answer 
the question a little bit? Well, I guess you're saying that humans are the people who can decide the proper optimization function. And that's an interesting claim. Obviously, it's going to be interesting trade offs, but maybe I'll send you an email. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, I'd appreciate it. I'd love to talk. I think, um, well, I know I have a bunch of questions I want to ask, but I think I'm going to take Cass up on his offer to answer email um, because we are running a bit long. Uh, but I, I'd like to hopefully everyone will join me again for welcoming him and thanking him for the really thought provoking talk. And thanks to all of you. I appreciate it. All right. And just a reminder, his his email address is there. He's on the Internet. And please do please do consider following up. Um, on, if you have more questions. Okay, I think people in person are leaving. So we're safe. All right, thanks so much. Awesome, thanks again.